Um, Amy, thanks so much for making the time to do this. Um, really quick introductions and, and a little setup, and then we'll get into it. I want to make the most of our time together. So my name's Mike Arouse, and I'm one of the co-founders at August Public. Um, Amy, introduce yourself. My name is Amy Edmondson, and I'm a professor at Harvard Business School, a professor of leadership and management. Great. Um, so this is Tuesday, March 17th, 2020. Um, I should probably say the hour, too. It's one yeah, <laughs> exactly. five in the afternoon. Um, things are changing so quickly, so rapidly. Um, and um, so many of the people that we know in our lives and our work, and certainly the clients that we work with at August, um, are really, you know, doing their best to keep up with and, and respond to this incredible, unique moment and challenge uh, presented by the COVID-19 uh, virus and, and everything that's going along with that. Um, so we wanted to do this quick interview. Um, I've got mm -hmm. some questions here that we'll walk through. Um, we're aiming for about a 20, 25 minute conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and just wanted to get this out as quickly as possible. So no editing, it's gonna be pretty, pretty scrappy. Yes. Um, but I'm sure that the wisdom will be useful. So if you're, if you're ready, I'll dive in. Let's go. All right. So just really quickly for those who maybe have heard the term psychological safety, but maybe could use just a little bit of a refresher. What is psychological safety? What isn't it? You know, I, I think the easiest way to say what it is, is that it's, that it's candor, it's directness, but it's really the, the experience of feeling able to be candid, to be direct which is another way, you know, if you want to think about this, um, we've all had moments at work and elsewhere where we have something to say, but we feel unable to say it. Um, and that might be because it's bad news or it might be because we lack confidence yeah. in its value. And, yeah. and so we hold back. So that's the experience of psychological safety, um, I think is, is um, really important at work, but not to be taken for granted. Absolutely. And yeah, I'm just curious just how this moment, you know, in, in all the work and, and specifically your work around psychological safety, just how have you been looking at this moment and this challenge that everyone is facing through that lens? Well, there's, there are quite a few angles um, that have been going through my head. And one is that in any kind of hierarchy, and let's face it, you know, every, everything's a hierarchy, um, the natural inclination is to not want to share bad news up the hierarchy. I think there's certainly evidence of this in, in DC. Um, mm -hmm. there, there, you know, there's um, a great deal of evidence of people just being uh, reluctant to cope with the consequences interpersonally, organizationally of delivering bad news up the chain of command, which, so there, that, that particular angle leads us to be aware of delays uh, in, in uh, sort of reaction time. And this is, you know, this is true in the, in the COVID-19 situation, but it's true in many organizations whereby the delay in sharing bad news from the places where they're aware of and close to the data uh, to the people in positions of authority to do something about it create much bigger problems than were necessary, you know, much bigger problems than we had to had to have. So one, so one big theme is uh, to try to minimize delays through transparency, through openness. And I would argue that won't happen unless the steps have put in, been put in place to create psychological safety uh, and, and really letting people know that, that not only is it okay to share bad news, it's incredibly problematic when you don't, right? In, in fact, if there's going to be sanctions or negative consequences from people in positions of authority, it ought to be when they learn that things weren't shared in a, in a timely way. Right. Um, I think another angle on psychological safety right now is just the, the tremendous fear people are feeling widely about what comes next. And meaning, uh, in, in, in many ways, psychological safety and fear are, are opposites, right? So if you're in a state of fear, you're not in a state of psychological safety. And so you might think, well, there's nothing you can do about that fear. And I think that's true. We should and will be afraid right now. But what you can do is make sure that fear is 
discussable, it's shared. I mean, I think being alone and afraid is terrible. You know, being mm-hmm. being in a in a safe safe distancing social distancing community that's afraid and sharing your thoughts and keeping people's spirits high um, is is a much less worse proposition. Yeah, Bill. Uh, on that note. Um, one of the things that we're hearing a lot of folks kind of wrestle with and talk about, people are um, physically alone. Most, Mm -hmm. a lot of people Mm -hmm. are Mm -hmm. right right now. Um, And they are dealing with tremendous uncertainty and fear, both in their personal lives and their professional lives. And what's your advice about um, kind of the value of, especially from a leader's perspective, what is the value of creating space to talk about those bigger challenges and fears, even if it might seem that that stuff is kind of separate from the work that needs to get done? I think the value is immense. And, and you know, it starts like this, um, a kind of a constant, and, and I think good organizations right now are doing this, a, a kind of a constant, meaning daily updating. Um, this is what we know. It's, it's fine to say, and I think should best practice is to say what we don't know and, and what we're doing. And so it's um, you, there that that uh, that first of all that reliable routine of knowing that you will get even if there's not a lot of new news that you will get some kind of update um, gives people something to hang on to and then the value of creating spaces where people can talk about their worries and and share the the small things they're doing uh, to either you know pass the time or reduce their children's worries or their uh, other family members' worries is um, is really, um, I think, very valuable indeed. And you know, the, I think we all know that when you're when you're working alone, without you know, without interruptions, without without colleagues, on the one hand, the day is longer, right? There's 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 in theory room to get things done. But but in practice, it's very hard uh, to just sit still and work the whole time, especially under conditions of anxiety. So mm-hmm. we need to create virtual water coolers, you know, those, those sanctioned um, moments where we're all going to get on some medium to uh, talk about what we had for lunch or to talk. That's, what, about that's exactly what we were doing. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what we were doing at August right before I got on this call. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're setting up two half hour um, kind of open-ended chats um, a day just yeah. exactly for that right no real agenda but just the normal the normal kinds of breaks that we would have mm-hmm. if we were face to face i think one thing that people are learning i mean there's there's certainly been uh, many people who've who've worked uh, from a distance for mm-hmm. years but i think a lot of people who haven't done that or work are learning how hard it is yeah yeah and what's the relationship between a sense of a sense of belonging and um, you know, being able to navigate a, a challenge like this. Uh, you know, my my um, without a whole lot of data, my mm-hmm. hypothesis would be it's a very high relationship, a strong mm-hmm. relationship. That if I have a sense of belonging, which is sort of the opposite of either being all alone or there are others, but I don't belong. I don't fit in. I'm not mm-hmm. a part of a community. Um, is um, I think a sense of belonging is a is a must a, pr- a critical psychological input to mm-hmm. being uh, feeling able uh, to confront the challenges that lie ahead. Yeah, and I'm um, shifting a little bit. So, so much of your research and expertise is in the healthcare space, and so when you're yeah. thinking about, you know, a hospitals, healthcare professionals, um, how do you think about how their ways of working? are serving them in, in a moment like this? And, and what can other organizations and leaders learn from them? Well, I think it's, um, it's a very challenging situation right now. And, and um, we all need to be thinking about how to support the healthcare providers who are working, already working longer hours than, than usual. And there's a very real chance, um, you know, almost a uh, um, 100% chance that people who are working right now are going to and are going to get sick and are going to have to step down and others are going to be called in um, who maybe haven't taken care of patients for a while. I mean, there's going to be a lot of churn and, and a, a lot of um, need for heroics and therefore a lot of need for um, 
the rest of us to to do our part of being being caring and helpful where we can be and um you know i, I it's just it's um i think we're just about you know we're not anywhere near where the worst of it will be yeah, so yeah you have to do and, and what are they, yeah what are kind of some of the norms and ways of working that exist there that are, are that are serving them yeah. at this moment yeah well, i mean i think there's a tremendous uh, spirit of 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 teamwork and helpfulness and of stepping in and right now people are going to be stepping in across boundaries you know if you 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 might not be an infectious disease doc but you're going to end up mm -hmm. uh, in, an internist or a hematologist you're going to end up being called in to um, work on uh, on this issue and um, tough decisions lie ahead as we've been seeing yeah. in our yeah in our colleagues in 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 europe and um those decisions can't easily be made on a on a one-off basis right with you know one by one people making decisions alone and for patients on a one by one basis there's going to have to be quickly we're quickly developing some some principles and guidelines and supports that are going to help people yeah. um, in these really challenging moments speaking of uh, people kind of jumping in shifting roles yeah. we talk a lot about how important it is for people to be able to contribute regardless of who they are or where they sit in an organization that helps an organization be more adaptive and and responsive um yeah how what are some of the kind of practical things that exist in, maybe in a hospital or healthcare setting that make that a little bit easier or more possible yeah, yeah. i mean i think there are there are there are norms and guidelines for for, for quick interactions, you know, mm -hmm. in, a, in any kind of teaming uh, situation, which is people working together to accomplish shared aims um, across boundaries, expertise, sometimes distance, mm -hmm. sometimes just shift shifts and schedules. And that requires being very deliberate, very thoughtful, you know, really clear, coherent communication. Um, here's what we know, here's what I'm doing, here's what I need to tell you, what questions do you have? So. And that, that, that sounds like it could take a long time. It doesn't have to. Right? Mm. This, these can be very deliberate, thoughtful, um, and, and, and careful exchanges of information and, and exchanges of, of, of questions uh, just to get up to speed quickly. I think it's, it's best practice to, you know, as we did at the start of this call, you know, introduce yourself. Don't assume we all know each other. Introduce yourself, um, what you've been doing, what you know, what you don't know um what you're worried about yeah yeah so speaking of that so you said what you know and what you don't know right and that's another thing that i've been thinking a lot about is how important it is you know you, you i've heard you use the language before about creating a learning frame right yes in a situation yes um, and talking it openly about the things that you don't know um in a moment like this i think a lot of leaders struggle even more than normal to maintain that learning frame for themselves and their team how and do yet, they do that what should they be saying yeah, in order I mean, to maintain that paradoxically the the learning frame is needed more than ever and quite mm -hmm. literally we've never been in this situation before right? mm -hmm. oftentimes we say something like that but we've been in pretty similar situations none of us have been in this situation before and so that necessitates a learning frame and that i think that only and because that's not the default and as you said under stress it becomes even less the default it becomes important to be explicit about creating it right? so creating creating the learning frame means um, um saying hey we don't know what's next we've never been in a situation before we will be learning as we go need your help need your input need your questions need your observations Please speak up about things that might not even seem to you necessarily important at the time, but they might be. None of us really know. Yeah, that's great. I, I think that's not only acknowledging what we don't know, but really saying, speak up about things, say things, even if you're not sure if they'd be valuable. Um, I want to hear about it because we don't know what might be valuable to right. us as right. we try to navigate. Right. That. And then the navigate is a good word because essentially what we're going to be doing is with a rough chart charter and a rough map, but not a very good one, we're going to be trying things. And we need to remain open and attentive to what the phenomena say back to us. And so the learning frame starts with recognition that we don't know, 
we're going to try to find out, we're going to act the best we can, and then continues with enormous sensitivity to the data of the experiences we have. It's as if we're all scientists all of a sudden, where we have hypotheses, we take action to test the hypotheses, we're collecting the data that will let us know how right or wrong the hypothesis was, and then we use that data to kind of rethink and tweak or alter course as, as needed. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, one other kind of uh, piece of the fear and uncertainty is, is a lot about economic uncertainty and, and business performance, uh, fears about business performance taking a downturn, um, or in, in a lot of industries that's already ha has happened. Um, what can leaders do to mitigate the impact of that of that economic and financial uncertainty, the impact of that on their employees? You know, there, there's no easy answer, or, there, or there's no single answer. I think mm -hmm. the, the question right now is best answered that they need to think about it. Um, and then, in, you know, in some companies, they can accept um, a kind of, and, and must accept a kind of a break in the action and do what they can to keep uh, employees whole. Um, maybe there's going to be some pay cuts. Trying to minimize layoffs is a good idea. You're going to earn that goodwill back um, in spades when, when things um, restart. Mm -hmm. um, but understandably, not every business, and especially some smaller businesses, don't, don't have the, the cash reserves to do, to do that in the, in the near term. And then you have to create communities that are going to do the best they can to support each other and feed each other and take care of each other. And, and again, the same principle is, this is what we know, this is what we hope to do. This is, we cannot know exactly how long this is gonna go or what, what impact it's gonna have. Um, and, and, and of course, sharing the you know, burden and sharing the pain, the one absolutely you know, um, unacceptable thing to do is to have some people and especially those at lower levels and lower paid pick up all of the all of the harm right right well uh, one one last question um so if you were you know a lot of leaders will be watching this if you were coaching a leader they're about to walk into their next team meeting um you know their next big moment um what should they <laughs> What should they say to their teams? What should they say to people? What beyond all the all the yeah. additional wisdom you you already shared? What I should mean, you say? I think just be real, be genuine, acknowledge your own um, your own fear, your own humility and, and fallibility, and uh, invite others to do the same. I think you know, in some sense, the leader's real job here is to be cognizant of reality as best we understand it right now, and then to find some ways, no matter how small, to create hope, right? To, to paint a picture that we will get through this. And in fact, we'll get through it because we're strong and because we're working together. So the, you know, the message is one of, yeah, I get it. I see reality, we see reality. Um, and we um, have to believe in a sort of hopeful outcome eventually and and we'll get there and we're certainly going to be a lot more likely to get there by by teaming up and working together and being candid and supporting each other and especially supporting you know some people are going to just be feeling a lot more pain and anxiety than others and right i think the degree to which you can ask yourself what can i do to help how can i contribute um is going to be um far more powerful than dwelling on what have I lost and what do I wish hadn't happened? I mean, that, that kind of thinking is natural and human, but not, not terribly helpful. Right. I asked my students um, last week when you know, they learned that classes would be canceled going forward, it would be on, moved to online. They're all disbanding to all over the world. And you know, they're, they're just, they had so many questions. Of course, we had very few answers and they, and they worry about the, you know, will the academics actually be good this way? They worry about the, their careers, and they worry about um, their, their sort of social cohesion. And those are three good categories. And all you can do is ask yourself and each other, how can I help? You know, how can I help mitigate the academic experience so that it, 
that you know that the lessening that we will have by not being in one classroom together is as small as it can be like what is it what i can do to stay to pay attention and to keep my colleagues paying attention and related to careers is going to be stuff you know how do i accept the things i cannot change um you know maybe that summer job you had for the airline isn't going to come through or maybe it is but in the right. meantime you know how do i how do i cope with that and how do i help some of my colleagues who might be even worse shape uh, to cope with that and then the answers to those two sets of questions will help with the third one which is create keeping that social cohesion alive right thank you so much this <laughs> this is great um uh could, if folks want to dig deeper on any of this stuff um, what do you recommend that they check out well i had a, a recent uh, hbr you know digital article on sort of when you know when understanding that that bad news is not is not comfortable or easy but it's it's really important and powerful and then all of this work on psychological safety and teaming is um, much more elaborated in in my two books one is called the fearless organization and uh, the other is called teaming great yeah and that hbr article um the title is don't hide bad news in times of crisis um so if, if people want to google that they, they can check okay. that out thanks mike Thank you so much. Take care. Be safe. Be well. Yeah, you too.